Facebook. Got it. Okay. All right. Bless you. Bye bye. Bye. Praise the Lord. Hello, everybody. It's Friday morning again. Where does the time go? Where do the weeks go? Um, we are now on the fourth of five messages concerning the resurrection. Uh, right after Jesus uh, raised from the dead. Um, today, we're going to take a look at the first part of John chapter 21. Uh, next week, we'll do some more of John 21. And then the following week, two weeks from now, uh, the plan is to start the book of Acts. And oh boy, I'm looking forward to that. Okay, well, today we're going to look at Breakfast with Jesus. <laughs> Sounds like a commercial. Let's do breakfast with Jesus. Okay, so um, I'm going to start by reading John 21, 1 through 14. John um, tells us the following information. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, excuse me, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I think that's seven. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him where he had taken it off and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals where there was fish on it and some bread. Jesus is a good cook, too. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. Okay, let's pray. Now, may the words of my mouth and meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. 
So let's talk about having breakfast with Jesus. Have you ever felt like you had something really important, something very, very special to accomplish in your life? Something important for you to do? And perhaps you were very excited, very enthusiastic. Maybe it was to get a certain job, go to a certain school, get a certain education, complete a particular task. And, and you were doing it. it. It was going along very nicely. You were making progress. You were going in the right or the positive direction. And just when you thought it was all going to come together, the whole thing fell apart. The rug was ripped right out from underneath you. Really? Your dreams, your goals became tarnished. Well, worse than that, they were obliterated. Suddenly, your direction in life was unclear, hazy, clouded by new and unexpected events in your life. What happened? We were doing so well with this. Well, one thing is for sure in life, nothing is easy that, that's worth doing. And nothing stays the same either. It's like trying to shoot at a, a moving target sometimes. Around the bend of, on the path of life is a new problem or a new blessing. It's kind of like a meandering stream, you know, meandering streams go like this, back and forth. You don't know what's coming around the next bend. And it can change the whole direction of our lives. So getting in tune with some of our of the feelings of Jesus' disciples, we find that they had this thing happen too. These men had invested their very lives with Jesus day in and day out for more than three years. And they saw some very, very significant and amazing things happen with Jesus. Well, most of Jesus' disciples stopped following him in the second and third level groups. These men believed in him to the point that they stuck with him through the ups and downs. And pretty much to the end. They had believed that Jesus was indeed the Jewish Messiah. They left their occupations to follow him. One, Matthew, was a rich tax collector, considered to be a big sinner. He left all that behind, the riches and the whole bit behind to follow Jesus. Several of them were fishermen. They left their boats, their nets, their fishing equipment. They were excited about, about being lieutenants of the future kingdom of God that was coming. Jesus, they thought, would be the king and savior of Israel as Messiah, and they would sit on his right and left hand side. They were on the, the, the ground floor. They were the in crowd. They struggled among themselves, we remember, in the Gospels, as to who was the greatest in Jesus' coming kingdom. Suddenly, although Jesus warned them, he taught them again and again about this, their, their boat of dreams sank, like they were hit with a torpedo. All of a sudden, Jesus knew it was coming. They should have known it was coming, but... They couldn't get themselves to believe it. Suddenly, it all came to an end. Within a matter of a few days, he was arrested, beaten, crucified, and dead, and laid in a tomb. But 
despair, gloom, depression. And uh, now what do we do? What do we do now? You know, I felt like this in 1972. I was 23 years of age. I had my heart set on being a business executive. And I was making really good progress toward that goal. I had finished, uh, I had gotten a, a marketing degree in a very good school, Fairleigh Dickinson University in Teaneck, New Jersey. And every year my grades had gone up and I was finally making the dean's list in my junior year and senior year. Um, things were going fantastically well. Um, and then I thought, well, let's keep going. So then I enrolled in business graduate school, also at FDU. And I was getting good grades. I'd work during the day and go to school at night. And um, I managed to, there was 120 people um, trying to get four positions with uh, the, the great company of Merck's. Uh, I was trying to get into a subsidiary of Merck's called Merck Sharp and Dome. And I was one of four out of 120 who um, was hired by this excellent pharmaceutical company. And uh, sky was the limit because I had a cousin, even though I, I never asked for his help. But I had a second cousin who was a wonderful man, Tommy Osterbrink who was the financial director of the international division. He was way up there. I was also, uh, I had an interview with one of the marketing executives in um, um, the, one of the local towns, I'm trying to think of, <laughs> near Kenilworth, uh, Rawway, in Rawway, you know, the big company in Rawway. Um, and this executive took me out to lunch. We had a very nice meeting and he was very impressed with my credentials and how well I was doing in school. I was taking, in my MBA, I was working on a pharmaceutical marketing degree. How specific could that be? He said, you do a good job in the field as a salesman for two or three years, and then we'll get you in the office here in Rawway as a marketing man. I could almost write my own ticket. The whole thing was lined up beautifully. I could commute from Kenilworth. It wouldn't be a, a long drive. It would be great. And then all of a sudden, the whole thing collapsed. It crumbled. like It was smashed like fine powder into fine powder. A new boss came to the Teterboro office where we were studying. We had been at it for three months. We had even had special training in um, Pennsylvania for a couple of weeks. And um, we were well along in our training. And soon we would be put out in the field. A new boss came to the office. Not a very good guy. And he shook things up. He shook our whole lives up. He wanted his own family members and his own friends in these excellent, this is an excellent sales position. He wanted that. So one by one, he called us into the office and he said, so what would you like, Don, on your, or Mr. Knott, what would you like on your resume? Would you like that it was that you resigned or that you were fired? Of course, what are you going to do? You have to say resign. You don't want that on your record. Nowadays, people would be, there'd be a major lawsuit. But in those days, he didn't have any, a leg to stand on. So we all resigned. Suddenly, I had no direction. All that I had been working for, striving for, moving in a certain direction for, obliterated, gone. One easy little meeting in, in uh, the boss's office. And I didn't know what to do next. Wow. The whole thing had collapsed. And I found myself in a vacuum, a void of meaning, 
I didn't know what else to do. I went back to school. <laughs> I was still uh, working on my MBA. And you know what? I can really relate to the disciples. Theirs was even worse. Um, they had a career and they laid it aside for Jesus. And then he gets himself killed. They didn't go back to school. They went back to their jobs. And the fishermen, several again were fishermen of the disciples, they went back to their fishing. True, Jesus did not stay dead. And in three days, we know the happy story that, um, and the true story, that he arose. He appeared several times, we're told three times to the disciples in, in very significant ways. He appeared to the two men walking to Emmaus. He appeared to the faithful women in, in the, the next the tier of uh, disciples and many other followers. In fact, 500 people saw Jesus, the risen Jesus, all over Jerusalem. Imagine, I, I think it would be um, pretty hard to not meet somebody who had, who had encountered the risen Christ. I can see somebody saying, well, that's nonsense. That's a myth. He didn't raise from the dead. No, there's, not, there's nothing to that story. And finding somebody who said, oh, yes, there is. I saw him. He showed me the nail prints in his wrists. Well, they would say hands. Um, but it was actually the wrist. The Greeks referred to all the way from the flexors of the hand to the tip of your fingers as, as hand. We, we break it up more to wrist and flexors of the hand and all that. Uh, today's passage, um, at this point in time, Jesus had, 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 had appeared two times already to the disciples. And the disciples are just blown away by these appearances. Um, they were short, but they were powerful. Most of the time he was absent, though, from the group, and they were left to kind of fend for themselves, and they weren't really sure. Where do we go from here? That's great, he's alive. But they began, began to wonder, what am I supposed to do now? We followed this guy around for three years, and we really don't know what, what to do now. We're, we're glad he's alive. Death couldn't hold him. He, he, he said he was going to raise from the dead. Now we remember that. But we feel powerless. We have... We have no aim. Where do we go from here? I don't know about you. And the rest of the guys, Peter said, he was the ringleader, but I'm going fishing. <laughs> and they decided to go with him. And so they went out in the boat. I remember going out on the Sea of Galilee. Um, both times I've been in Israel. Oh, that's an amazing place. Huge, huge lake or small sea, if you will. These uncertain men were, were groping for a sense of purpose and meaning, and they went back to what, the, what else they knew. They're trying to fill in the gaps, grasping at straws, turning to something they, they knew how to do, fishing. But it didn't turn out too well. They fished all night and they caught nothing. The sun came up. Jesus stood on the beach. The disciples did not recognize him. Did you know it was, they didn't know it was Jesus. How often do we find ourselves in the same kind of boat as the disciples. There are times that, that Jesus comes to us, he speaks to us, and we don't even realize it. Maybe he speaks through another person. Even sometimes an unbeliever he can speak through. They don't realize what they're saying. And we don't recognize him in what that person told us. Jesus comes to us in various experiences, painful or joyful, or both. And we don't get it. We don't, we don't recognize him. The key is getting on in life 
by looking for Jesus in all that happens to us. Be ready to eat breakfast with Jesus. Jesus said to the disciples, have you any fish? Did you catch anything? I remember on the Jersey Shore, we, we had a place there when I was a kid and in my early 20s. And I would go along there and I'd ask the fishermen, anything biting tonight? Did you get any, catch anything this morning? And the fishermen said to Jesus, no, got nothing, nothing. They, it was natural. They were to be disappointed and frustrated put all that effort in to go out there to get something. They were tired and they were sore and they were a hundred years from a hundred yards from shore and nothing to show for it. To us, Jesus says, how are you doing with your Christian life? Is it going well with you? Some of us say, yeah, it's good. Some of us may say, no, no, I wish it was better. Some of us are frustrated, we're tired, we're confused as Christians. We're just like the disciples. We have no power in our lives. We have no power to live the Christian life. We believe Jesus rose from the dead. We believe the scriptures and its doctrines. We're trying to do our best to follow Jesus, but somehow we just don't seem to have the power. We have an intellectual understanding. We, we do believe. But the reality of serving a risen Savior on a daily basis, where we live, is not so easy. We just need something. And that was the problem with the disciples. They had the same thing going on. They had not yet experience a real Pentecost. Pentecost? Yeah, we'll deal with that in the book of Acts, but basically it was the coming of the Holy Spirit. They were drifting aimlessly in the sea of life, fishing for something to help them do what they were trained to do. Every one had a, of them had a PhD in the school of hard knocks. They were rough and tumble fellows. They had lived tough lives. For three years, they had seen it all, traveled around with Jesus. They had faith and knowledge and experience. They needed just one more ingredient to live a powerful Christian life, the Holy Spirit. They needed a Pentecost experience. It is by the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit, that we have the power to live as Christians. We cannot do it on our own. Our own John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, experienced this. This man was well-educated. He was brilliant. He, he knew several languages. He had the New Testament memorized in Greek. <laughs> he lived as fine a moral life as any man. In his case, he came to America to save two things, to save souls of American Indians and save his own soul. So in his case, he wasn't even a far, as far along as maybe you and I are. He wasn't even a Christian yet, and yet he lived like a Christian. He was a preacher, but he lacked the power of the Holy Spirit in his life. I'm not sure if it was on the way over or on the way back. He got out of there because he got himself in so much trouble with the, with the colonists. And he came back to England. But on one of those trips, he saw a group of people called Moravians. These are people from Germany who were on fire for God. And the, there was a horrible storm. It looked like this ship was going to go down for sure. He was so worried, and he thought his soul would be lost. But the Moravians, men, women, and children, got together, and they were having a worship service and praising God, like just as if it had been a a beautiful sunny day. At any moment, the ship could break up and, and go down. They weren't afraid. They showed no fear. No fear. Because they knew if we die, 
to go to be with the Lord. John Wesley said to himself, they got something I don't have. So when he got back to England, he went to a Bible study on Aldersgate Street. And um, he heard a reading from Romans and a commentary on it. And suddenly he realized Jesus Christ died for me personally, for my own sins. And he came into a saving faith with Jesus Christ. And not only that, but he was empowered by the Holy Spirit. He started a, a ministry that was called the Wesleyan Revival, along with his brother and others helped him. And all of England that was going down the tubes had an amazing revival. And thousands and thousands of people were swept into the kingdom of God. So the question is, you've been filled and empowered by the Holy Spirit. You may be a Christian and you have the Holy Spirit. You just haven't, the Holy Spirit is, is in, we're not letting him do his thing within us. And we should say, Lord, I yield to you. Do whatever you need to do in me. Wake me up, empower me with your spirit. Let me focus on you, um, oh Holy Spirit, it's the spirit of Jesus. Jesus said, cast a net on the right side of the boat and you will find some fish. And the disciples did. They found 153 large fish. This is no fish story. Why 153? I'm not sure what the significance of that is. But the key was they obeyed Jesus. They were so open and hungry for him. And the results was excellent. When you obey Jesus and you call upon him and his Holy Spirit to work mightily in your life, there's no, no wonder what you can do. You can do things you didn't think you ever could do. We need to cast our nets. <laughs> Wherever he tells us to do, we need to come into shore and eat breakfast with him, like the disciples did. We need to fellowship with him on a daily basis. He took bread and he gave it to them. He cooked some fish for them. Uh, <laughs> and he turned their whole lives right side up again. And he gave them their marching orders to go and preach the gospel to every creature. He empowered them. You and I, on a daily basis, can be empowered by the Holy Spirit. He can put such a bounce in our step, we can't contain it. We've got to go tell somebody else about Jesus. Not just in words, but in actions, in attitude. Mm-mm. So, when's the last time you ate Je breakfast with Jesus? Have you done it? Time to eat breakfast with Jesus. Open his word. Pray. Take time. Say, Lord, fill me with your Holy Spirit. I, I want to serve you. I want I want uh, to see your kingdom um, expand. I, I want to sow some seeds of the kingdom in the hearts and minds of other people. Um, that I come in contact with. Some are even my own family members or friends. Oh, wow, how exciting. I, every day I look forward to seeing who I can talk to about Jesus and try to demonstrate his, his loving kindness to, to that uh, person or persons. It's exciting. Uh, I'm doing things that I never thought I could do. And that's the Holy Spirit. All these teachings you, many of you have seen. I never dreamed when I was a young person that I could do this kind of thing. Uh, or I'd have the power to do it. I have the power to do it because I have the Holy Spirit working. And I'm trying, guys. I'm not, I haven't, I, need, I still need to go a long way. I'm trying to get out of the way and let him do his thing within me. All right, let's pray. Um, Lord Jesus, we thank you and praise you for this message. We might be Christian, we really love you, but get us on fire, set us on fire for you. Fill us to, oh, to so much with the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus, that we can't help but, but talk about you and, and be a witness for you and help other poor souls that don't know what we know to know you, oh Lord. Do a mighty work within us, empower us, we pray. How exciting it is to, to serve you. 
Uh, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hope to see you next time. And we'll finish this series on what happened after the resurrection. Have a great day.